So welcome back everybody. This is a video that I have been promising everyone ever since starting our own house build here. Now we're gonna go over a lot of information in this video, so you may wanna grab a pen and paper, but this video is ultimately for the person that really just doesn't have a clue where to start. They think they wanna build their own home, they may wanna sub some stuff out, be their own general contractor, or do the labor themselves, much like I did. So I've compiled a very long list here of basically how the process starts from start to finish because whenever I started building my own house, I was clueless. Where do you start? What do you do? It was kind of a daunting task and a bit overwhelming, but now that I have the flow and process down, I thought that I would share that with you. So the reason I'm standing out here in the yard, before you even go pull your building permit, one of the first things you need to do, let's go ahead and assume that you have your property. By the way, we have a video coming up we're gonna cover property buying tips, what to look for before you even make the uh, final purchase of that property, do's and don'ts, we're gonna cover that. But let's assume you already have your property. Right here beneath me is our septic tank and our leach field. So before you can go pull your house building permit, you need to go to your local sanitation department and actually apply for a permit. They're gonna send somebody out or either you're gonna hire them yourself to pull soil sample tests. It's called a perk test or percolation test. Now all of this may vary based on where you live and your local codes and regulations. But long story short, if you don't have a proper septic system to put in, well, you're not getting a house permit. So you need to start here. Luckily, pulling the soil sample test is a relatively quick process. They'll send the samples off, make sure that you have good proper drainage here, and you can put a septic system in. And it's a relatively affordable process. I think the soil test around $150 in our area, and it's about $500 total dollars for the permit at the sanitation department. Also, during this time, if you're going to go get a loan from a bank, you need to go ahead and have you a full cost breakdown of what you expect your home to cost, and I always recommend buffering that by 25%. We just released a video with a full cost breakdown of our home. You may want to go check that out. I'll put a link down in the description as well to give you totals on absolutely everything that we spent. We were fortunate that we paid for our home outright. We saved for about a decade, took the profits out of selling our last house and built our own. But if you're going to go through the loan process itself, you need to go ahead and be working that while you're running some of these tests so you don't have further delays. So the next thing that you need to be looking into, hopefully you've already done this once you purchased your property but can you get power run in? Is power available? How are you gonna get temporary power to build your house? So depending on your local power company, ours, if you already have a set of building plans and can show that you're in the process, will actually go ahead and run power to your property for free. Now, some areas it may not be like that, but regardless, you're gonna to go to your building department and you're gonna get a temporary power permit. So you can pull a temporary power permit for lots of different reasons, whether it be an RV, well for agricultural property or that you're going to build a house itself but you need to go ahead and be working that process they'll have to come out and do some inspections you're going to have to go work with your local electric co-op to get power on the property you want to have all that set up and ready whenever you get your permit so you can start building your house you're going to need power here for yourself and your contractors so speaking of potentially getting a temporary permit for say a well what are you most likely going to pull it for your house have you checked and verified that you can actually get water on your property that's something else to take before you actually build your home. And believe it or not, our local building department requires some sort of roadway access. So before I can even go apply for a building permit, I had to go to our county road department. And believe it or not, I had to fill out a permit there and it was about a nine page engineer drawing to put in a driveway at the end of this road right here where it meets the highway. We had to meet a certain culvert size, slope, uh, roadbed packing, all kinds of stuff. And they actually had to come out and do inspections. And I could not get a building department until I showed proof that I had had all that done. So here's the other flip side of that. Before you can even go pull your building permit right here, that driveway needs to be in. And you need to go to what's called your GIS department, your addressing department. This will be at your courthouse where most of these things are, or your local courthouse annex. So thanks to 9-11 and the terrorist security measures in, you cannot, at least where I'm at, build a house or pull a permit until you have 911 addressing here. So you're gonna need to go through the steps in that department and actually have a physical residence address here. So here's the other side of that. You're building a new house here. You're gonna have construction work going on out here that could be a little dangerous. You have power out here. You have the potential for fire now. 
Plus, you're going to want to have an insured structure that, well, the fire department, everybody else can get to. They cannot come out to you until they know physically where you're at and you have that 911 addressing. So that's another big reason why that has to be done before you get your building permit. So I forget the name of the department, but it was in my local building department. The other thing that you're going to want to check on your property before you go pull this building permit is what's called a flood and elevation survey. It's a topography map and there's a certain apartment inside your courthouse, again in my building department, to where they'll pull that. You show the actual location where you're going to build the home. They'll make for sure that their topography map shows that you're not in a low lying or flood prone area because that may determine whether you can or cannot build there. So you need to go get that checked out as well. Hopefully you've already done that part of the process back when you were buying the property itself to make sure it was all high and dry, flood insurance wasn't needed, or that you could build, period. But that's something very important to check out. So now assuming that you got your septic permit and your percolation tests were good, by the way, those permits are good for about 18 months, but you can get extensions on them. Now we can move into the rest of the process here, moving more into the building department, the permitting, the house itself. So let's go talk about that. So here we are inside of our home. This is a pole barn or barn dough style home, but everything that you and I are about to discuss will cover pretty much any traditional building technique. It's all the same in the building department's eyes. So let's head upstairs to my office and do some further talking. By the way, over 200 videos on the channel of me building this house, talking more in depth on code, showing the entire process from slab through framing all the way up into the final details. So if you're looking for further information than this video will, will provide as far as the actual building techniques and codes go, feel free to go check those videos out. All right, so now assuming you have all the exterior stuff done that we just discussed from the roadway, the 911 addressing, the septic test, does not have to be installed at that point in time, but your soul has to show that you're capable of doing that here. Water hookup is available, the list goes on and on. Now we can start moving more toward applying for the building permit itself, because those things are gonna have to be shown in the building permit process. Now I'm gonna go ahead and assume that you've got your architectural plans done and your drawings are engineered and stamped. That is what's required here and in most places. So before you even go pull your building permit, you're gonna go to the building department itself at your local courthouse or annex, and you're gonna submit your house plans and engineer drawings, you're gonna pay a fee. I think it was like $150. It's ultimately a review fee. So the building inspector himself is gonna review over these plans, make sure everything looks safe and to code. You don't need to go back and make any more changes and then they'll approve them. Then you can start the actual building process itself as far as the permitting process. Now this is gonna vary wildly based on your location. We paid about $1,500 just in permitting fees uh, to start that process. I've heard in some places, big metropolitan areas, it may be ten dollars or $15,000 for the permitting process. Ultimately, what you're paying here now is a fee for the inspector to make multiple trips out to the property and to go over and inspect everything. So you're gonna fill out a very large packet. You're gonna include, again, some of that stuff showing that you have that address, that the driveway is complete, everything else that the packet requires. Be prepared that you're not gonna go to the office itself fill that right out. You're probably going to make a trip home and gather up all this stuff. It's a relatively involved process itself. So this is also a good time to take note that at least in my area, once your building uh, permit is issued to you, it's good for 12 months. It's also a good time to note too, if you're getting a loan through a bank, typically they have time frames that you have to meet as well. And that's usually about a year. So you need to be discussing with your bank how quickly they want you to build. Explain that if you're building yourself, you're probably going to go over that length of time all that needs to be stated up front. You also need to figure out with your bank if they're going to allow certain amounts of money to go out at certain time frames. Typically, you don't get it all to go build your house. They'll do draws and allow you to pull a certain amount at certain times. So you need to be budgeting and be prepared for that as well. Now, the good news is banks will allow extensions uh, depending on the type of bank that you're dealing with, and the building department will also allow extension. So one of the first things I told you at the beginning of this process, and before you can even go apply for a bank loan, and even if you're paying out of pocket, have that full cost breakdown. Don't forget, buffer it at least 25% for all the unexpected things. And now you know a value of your home and what you need to insure it for. No bank, and you should not be building out of pocket without builder's risk insurance. It's pretty much a necessity. So you're gonna go deal with a 
local insurance company, I would recommend doing this before you break ground or do anything. You need to have that builder's risk insurance. Say your house catches on fire or a hurricane comes or some tornado or major event happens while you're building your house, this is a different type of insurance. And typically you'll get the insurance with the same company that you're gonna get your homeowner's insurance down the road. So they'll roll it from a builder's risk insurance once you get your final CO and basically final approval, the house is ready for move in and you'll convert it to your regular homeowner's insurance. So now usually the first step, here we go. This is kind of a lengthy and involved up to this point. You're ready to break ground, you got your permit, uh, you've got your financing, however that may be. All right, so one of the first things that you're gonna start and do with a home is your foundation. And typically it's required that you do soil tests for your foundation as well to see the soil type and if you can actually build in that location or if it's gonna be required that you do a more substantial uh, footer foundation, whatever that may be. And I actually suggest going ahead and getting that done, getting board samples done in case you're on a very thick type of pipe clay, loose sandy soil, because your engineer themselves is gonna to need to engineer the foundation for that. So I would actually back up and say that needs to be one of your first steps, depending on the type of foundation that you do. So if you're doing under slab plumbing, which is very common down here in the South, this is gonna be one of your first types of inspections. You're actually gonna do your dirt pad. The inspector may require an inspection for that to come out and do soil compaction test to determine can you you go ahead and continue to move forward with foundation work or does it need time to actually settle out you need to be prepared for that if you're having to pack and bring in a ton of soil for your foundation there could be lengthy weeks or month time frames and inspectors could require for the soil to compact settle and be safe to then put say a concrete foundation on but assuming all that's good your dirt foundation's in now at this point where you're going to start your under slab plumbing assuming you're doing that any under slab electrical work you need to dig out that dirt start of the foundation run all that and you need to get your first plumbing inspection after the inspector gives the okay there before you can move on to the final uh, slab foundation work, you at least here have to have under slab termite treatment. So you're gonna have to call and get a licensed termite treatment company out. They'll actually give you a form showing that this has been done. And typically the inspector at this point will give you the thumbs up. Now you can do your vapor barrier, your rebar work and get ready to pour the slab itself. A lot of times the inspector will then make an additional trip back out to check that vapor barrier, the rebar work, make sure everything meets plan. So at least in my case, after the foundation's poured, it's kind of quite a while before you'll have an additional inspection, depending on what else you got going around the property. At this time, you could be putting your septic in, or you can wait till much later in the process. There was no time frame commitments for that here. So now that your foundation's down and cured based on the amount of time that uh, the foundation company told you to wait, typically I like to wait a couple of weeks, actually wet my concrete and allow it to cure slowly. Go ahead and start your framing. So once you have your whole house framed up and it's just the skeleton itself you're actually going to have to do a framing inspection now based on where you may be that could be just checking nail patterns on the lumber spacings here in a hurricane state we had a lot of extra strapping and requirements they're going to check your headers uh, load bearing walls make sure everything's right where it needs to be and it takes quite a while especially building it yourself to get all your framing done before you'll call for that first inspection now in the event of doing an odd style home like we did, a post frame style home, we actually started with our roof before we ever did the inspection. So depending on where that's at in the process, let's go through the, the roof inspection itself. So the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna have your trusses up, you're gonna go ahead and put your sheathing down, and then at that point in time, I had to get my inspector out for a nail pattern inspection. Lots of nails pattern inspections in a home, so keep that in mind. Don't cover up anything until they check that. So for example, all the sheathing that we put up on the roof, there was a certain perimeter nail spacing that had to happen and then what's called in the field. So if you have a big four by eight sheet right here, there's a different nail spacing in the field. The inspector will have to climb up there, use it with a tape measure, go around, check a few random spots and then give you the thumbs up to go ahead and put whatever vapor barrier down that may be. For us, that was a titanium underlayment. You may be using felt, whatever your engineer and plans call for. 
My inspector then had to come right back out and check a nail pattern spacing on my vapor barrier. That one actually caught me off guard. They wanted to make sure that the vapor barrier itself was nailed down where the actual manufacturer stated to. Because a lot of times at this point, people may put a vapor barrier down and it may be quite a while, I guess, before you put a roof material on. They wanna make sure stuff doesn't blow off, uh, damage anything underneath. Not really 100% sure why. Again, that one did catch me and including my contractor a little off guard. So once you have your vapor barrier inspection, then it goes to whatever roofing material that may be, whether it's shingles or in my case, metal. My inspector then had to come back out. Again, being in a hurricane state, I had a lot extra screw and nail pattern requirements. You had to come out and make sure that we were screwed down on the edges a certain amount. That's where your tin's typically gonna lift and out in the field as well. He also gonna check venting uh, and a few other things that are required as far as any blow through leaks, proper venting, et cetera, with the roof. So back to the framing. We've already had our frame inspection. Let's say we've passed that. At this point in time, you're gonna be running any through wall electrical, plumbing, you may be moving to sheathing outside. You can kind of do all of this out of order, but that's gonna require some inspections as well. So let's talk about everything that you have to do before you close the walls themselves up. A lot of people are gonna go ahead and go to sheathing on the exterior. Same as with the roof. Say you're putting up plywood or OSB, there's gonna be a nail pattern inspection there. Some may actually require sealing of the joints. There's a certain spacing in between your sheathing. I know for here, it's one eighth inch gap to allow for expansion and contraction. All of this stuff, by the way, I've covered in the full build series on the channel. That's the more in-depth stuff that I was talking about. But you're gonna have to have inspections for that. So each finish of a process typically has to be inspected before any coverings can be put on. So once you get a sheathing inspection, now it's just like the roof again. Go ahead and put your vapor barrier up. And my inspector actually had to come back out and make sure again that my vapor barrier was secured properly to the house. At this point in time, you're considered what's dried in. You can go ahead and move into the house itself. You may want to start on windows and doors, which also require inspections to make sure that you've sealed everything out correctly and installed the windows and doors correctly. And most people at this point are doing in-wall electrical and plumbing at this point. So you're gonna have rough in electrical inspection. You're gonna have rough in plumbing inspection after that's done, checking all the codes and rules that go along with that. It's also a good time to mention, are you using any natural gas or propane in the house? You'll be dealing with a completely different company there or you may be installing yourself and they're gonna to have to come out and do pressure test on that. So there is a rough in pressure test on your plumbing itself, and there's a rough end pressure test on all your gas fittings and lines. So this is a good time to mention based on the type of permit that you are gonna pull. This varies area by area. Believe it or not, there's certain parts of the country where you don't even pull a house building permit. They're so rural, but you may have to do either a septic and sanitation or electrical. They're very basic. But where I live, I was able to pull what's called a owner builder permit. So everything we're mentioning, electrical, plumbing, framing, all that permit was under my name. So I'm technically either the person doing the job or I'm the general contractor on the job and I am the first point of contact and what's held accountable for meeting codes for that. And I am actually able to sub out any of this work or do it myself. So you need to check your permits that you were pulled. A lot of areas will not allow you to do your own major tie-in or electrical work. So make sure you double check your permit itself. You may have to have a licensed contractor to do that work. And I should also mention, as part of your builder's risk insurance and all, typically your insurance company is going to hound you that anybody that you do bring on the property that does any contract work that you sub out, you need to make sure that they're licensed and insured because a lot of times that stuff's not covered under your builder's risk. That's just kind of act of God, so to speak, damage that you always hear about, weather, uh, maybe a, a tornado, hurricane, earthquake, something such as that, that typically doesn't cover a contractor's fault. Their license and insurance is expected to cover that. So keep that in mind if you sub any of this work out. So you're doing all your rough end work right now. Again, we haven't closed up the interior walls. This is typically when you're gonna be doing all your rough end HVAC work. All your AC lines are being ran, all your tie-ins are done, they're being wrapped up, and the inspector's gonna have to come out and do a rough end inspection on that as well. So keep in mind any penetrations through the wall at this point in time with all your electrical and plumbing has to be completely fireproof and sealed. They make a specialized foam 
Uh, so anytime you go through one level to the next or a fire break in a wall, those penetrations cannot allow any air through to feed a fire. And that's gonna be part of your rough in inspection as well. So make sure you go get some very cheap cans of fireproof fire sealant foam and have all that sealed out before the inspector ever comes to inspect those final rough in electrical and plumbing. So once you get the okay there on those rough ins, now this is where most people move into insulation in the wall. We did all spray foam insulation. You may be doing rough fiberglass insulation and my inspector had to come out and inspect that as well. So now everything is done inside the wall. You've covered it up before we do the sheetrock or whatever final covering on the outside. It's kind of one last walk through to make sure there's nothing missed before it's all covered up. So depending on when you get your septic system done, the sanitation department will have to come back out and do a final sign off on that work, as well as ours also had to see how we physically tied in from our water source to the house. Usually this is already done at this point because your rough and plumbing is done. So you're gonna have to get a sanitation sign off on this point as well. So usually at this point, we go on to say sheetrock, probably the most common wall covering, maybe doing shiplap siding, whatever that may be. This was another very odd one that caught me off guard. It's not in every area, but I actually had to do a screw pattern inspection on my sheetrock. So when in doubt, always call the inspector once you're done with anything major to see if they need to come out. So we had to roughly hang sheetrock. It had to be screwed every so often. And then I had to get the inspector out to give the thumbs up and approve that before the the sheetrock company was allowed to go ahead and finish doing tape texture and mudding. So keep that in mind, make sure you ask that up front or call about it. So a lot of times while this work's going on, you may be moving back to the exterior. Again, it's already house wrapped at this point, that inspection's done, and you're gonna move on to whatever type of siding you may be. Now, lots of manufacturers have very specific requirements for their siding, and believe it or not, typically manufacturer's requirements have to be honored above and beyond code. Even the inspector has to honor those as well. So for example, we did fiber cement siding, and that has a certain amount of distance that has to be off the ground, certain way that you butt the joints together. I actually had to do flashing cards behind. That was something that was very important to the inspector. They had to see that. And we had certain nail spacings as well. I had to hit a certain amount of studs. All butt joints had to tie on a stud gaps on the end for caulk and sealing, flashing, all that stuff required an inspection as well and a final sign off on the siding. So once your sheet rocks up, typically you'll go in and do your final tie ins for your plumbing. Um, so you're gonna get a final sheet rock inspection. After that's done, you'll do that final plumbing inspection. This is normally when you do uh, your paint put all your final electrical so you'll get your final electrical inspection. Your final HVAC is also an inspection, should be getting tied up at this point. We're getting more toward the end of the house. So I should also mention what's not required to get your final CO or certificate of occupancy. Walls technically don't have to be painted. Trim doesn't have to be in. Heck, flooring doesn't even have to be done. Now this could vary in your area, but this is very common. What you're mainly looking for, and the inspector's mainly looking for to make sure your house is nice and safe and meets code to move in, uh, the requirements for me were sanitation was done, water hookup was done, your final plumbing, your final electrical. They wanted the kitchen complete, believe it or not. You had to have some way to show that you could cook and live in the home. There wasn't many other requirements. Obviously your doors and windows, everything we've covered at this point is good, but I want people to know you can actually get a move in permit for your house and still finish and work as you go. A lot of people want to finish up that route. So paint and minor things are not actually required to move in. It's your main sanitation, plumbing, electrical, and in my case, a uh, relatively complete kitchen at least one gas appliance since I did gas plumbing in the house and one way to show that I could cook. Obviously at that point too, your fire alarms, carbon monoxide detectors, things like that are fully required before they can sign off as well. So all right, so we're wrapping the house up at this point. Before I could also get my permit, I have to have what's called a blower door test. That's becoming very common now across all the states. So it's an ACH number that you're given or air changes an hour. You're gonna have to hire somebody to come in. They're gonna seal up one of the doors with specific equipment that reads pressure settings, has a fan on there. And long story short, that fan's either gonna suck air out of the house or blow air in, you're gonna get a certain pressure setting and it's gonna tell how many leaks are in the house, how many air changes there are. So they'll come in and also do a full volume calculation on your house. So long story short, 
in our state, which is still very high because they just started implementing this, seven air changes an hour, which is an extremely leaky home, qualifies, and you have to be under that number. I know the next state away from us, Georgia, requires three air changes an hour, which is still a big air turnover. So it's the full volume of the house, three times, cannot be turned over more than three times an hour, for example, to meet that specific requirement. This is all part of the new energy efficiency initiative to make sure your house is sealed well and there's no major gaping holes or problems which could lead to moisture issues, mold issues, and again, just running a lot of extra electricity and not being very energy efficient. So that number is gonna have to be done by someone that's licensed to do that. They'll have to send it into the building department before you can get that final sign off on your permit itself. Also during this time, the termite company has to come back. They have to be a licensed company to give you the official form. They'll have to do foundation treatment around your house and this must be posted in your house at all times. Typically our uh, inspectors require this to be posted on the inside breaker door for your main breaker panel. Once you get your final electrical thumbs up from the inspector, they'll go ahead and call your local co-op, which will do your final, final meter hookup outside. So you can go ahead and get power into your house. That's something that also has to be fully complete. Appliance hookups and testing. My inspector did a quick walkthrough of that, especially since we had propane and gas appliances in the house. Again, they're gonna check your fire alarms, carbon monoxide detectors, and do a full walkthrough on that. We had to have battery backup as well as all of them hardwired. He'll go through and test and press one to make sure that they all trigger in the house, that they're in the proper locations, on and on and on. At this point, your certificate of occupancy is issued to you. You're allowed to go ahead and move in. Now again, depending on where you are, there could be some other requirements I didn't mention there, or you may have to do even less. Like I know a couple counties over where I have a friend that builds multi-million dollar homes. He's never heard of a sheetrock inspection in his life. Every area is gonna be quite different. So once you get that CO, congratulations, you can move in. Now at this point in time, you need to contact your insurance company. Actually immediately, once you're getting that CO, convert your builder's risk over because a lot of them will not insure you past an actual CO move in. So move over to regular homeowner's insurance, get that process complete. And one other thing worth mentioning, especially if you live out in the country like us and actually have several acres of property. This is also the point in time that you will go to your property appraiser's office. Don't forget to do this. Save you big money on taxes and file for your homestead exemption. Typically, you can pull out one acre for the property itself. For us, our property is rated ag, so it's a much lower tax bracket, but you have to pull out at least one acre for homestead exemption or around the house itself. But make for sure that you're not paying all those property taxes on the rest of your property that could be zoned ag. So that's kind of my full walk down in process there. Hopefully you enjoyed that. It took me quite a while to try to remember all this and put it together. Again, don't forget several hundred videos on the channel showing the framing, everything from the ground up all the way to completion and talking more in depth about the codes, showing what you should do. This would be a several hour long video to try to remember and go over all that. And don't forget, down in the description, go check our podcast channel out, The Kelly's Off Script. I'm about to get a licensed and insured general contractor in that builds houses daily. This is his job to give us some more insight on what we just discussed and more importantly, what's going on in the local housing market right now, the economy, as far as um, how hard it is to get things, the supply chain issues that we have all been facing ever since the COVID stuff has started, where he sees the future of the housing market going. There's a lot that we can discuss there. So for those of y'all that are getting ready to build or thinking about it, there's gonna be some valuable information in and of that. All right, so coming up next, we're gonna do a how to purchase land video, kind of walking everybody through the process on how we discovered our property, got a really good deal on it, um, give some tips and tricks there, how to kind of get away from the big, uh, the big companies, so to speak, that everybody's competing for and driving prices through the roof, how to find the stuff off the beaten path. And there is a laundry list of things that you really need to check and make for sure on a piece of property before you ever sign the line and buy it. They could come back to haunt you down the road and you may not even be able to build your dream home on that property that you've already purchased. So we're gonna discuss that here coming up before long. Catch you on the next video.